As Dr. Sievers said, I'm a managing partner of uh, Finoco. Um, I do have my bachelor's degree, which in this room I think makes me the least educated person <laughs> in the room. And so, um, uh, in 2018, our company grew uh, about two th 250,000 plants uh, at five farms here in Colorado. Uh, we also consulted uh, for operations in Minnesota, West Virginia, um, Kentucky, um, and did some work in Nevada and California um, as well. Um, the, today's presentation, we're going to be talking about the basics of growing CBD. I understand how many farmers are in the room. Great. Awesome. Um, so this is going to be a little bit more directed, kind of just on a real high level overview to provide some background on um, the products that are going into some of the scientific research and are being consumed uh, both in the regulated, i.e. dispensaries, and the unregulated uh, marketplaces. Uh, this actually is one of our both same um, is one of our fields uh, growing um, some of our genetics in Minnesota um, that's about a 25 acre field that's about half grown uh, and this is as we've talked about this is uh, a CBD plant versus true quote-unquote industrial hemp which is your 14 foot tall bean pole uh, type of plant this particular genetic grows as more of a bush it'll grow about five feet tall and about five feet wide um, you can grow the uh, CBD uh, in your basement. You can, if you have a legal registration for that, you can grow it in your basement, in your garden, in your backyard. Um, today's uh, program, we're going to be talking about actually farming it out into a field. Um, obviously, you can grow it in a greenhouse as well. Uh, so this is kind of your basic checklist. If you want to get into farming, um, this is basically what you would walk, your, walk down through how you determine if you're wanting to grow one plant, 200 plants, or 200,000 plants is really based on your goals, your time, and the capital you have uh, available to you to grow. Um, and we'll kind of walk down through each one of these today uh, in the presentation. Uh, first and foremost, as Dwayne just went through, uh, you do have to uh, get a license. You have to be approved and get that license. Uh, kind of unique thing here in Colorado is if I had walked onto the university with a marijuana plant, I could walk up to anybody in this room and say, here, there's a marijuana plant, because you're all allowed to have a certain number of marijuana plants in your possession here in Colorado. If I'd walked into the room with an industrial hemp plant, in my case a CBD plant, uh, are you, do you own, own a, a grow license? So it would be illegal. I could theoretically go to jail for handing her a CBD plant. And so there's definitely some odd nuances with the laws. Um, and so just it's important to understand what's going on. So if you do get into this business, you can't just say to all your friends and associates, hey, I'm growing the CBD stuff. Come out to the backyard and I'll give you a few plants and you can grow some too. You do have to go through the application process. Um, as Dwayne talked about, it's very easy. Come on to the, the Colorado Department of Agriculture site. You can get registered to do that. There's really two steps to this. Um, one is to get your license itself, and the other one, as Dwayne, Dwayne talked about, and so I won't go into a lot of detail, is the ongoing reporting. And so you do need to keep up to date with them. I will say that the Colorado Department of Ag has been incredibly helpful and beneficial in working with uh, my, myself and my peers in the industry. Um, easy to get along with. They are incredibly supportive of the people that are following the laws and wanting to have good intentions uh, getting involved in industrial hemp or into the CBD space. Um, your next step here in Colorado uh, is water. Um, obviously we all know that Colorado does not have a plethora of water and so you can have a wonderful piece of property but until you actually understand the water rights uh, whether you have access to a residential well a limited ag well, an unlimited ag well, um, these things also play into how you're planning on watering your field. What we're looking at here is flood irrigation. And so um, I'm sure as you've driven past some of the fields in Colorado, you've seen these ditches and little tubes and all kinds of different things. That's what's referred to as flood irrigation. There's really three types of ways you can water your plant. One is through flood irrigation. Uh, the other is through a pivot system or spray system of some kind. And the third is some kind of a drip line. Each of them have kind of pros and cons. One of the things with the, the CBD plant is they like their roots like to breathe. And so basically they like to take a drink of water just like we do, take a drink, 
and then take a nice big breath. And when the plant does that, it puts on biomass on the top side and gets really happy. And then it grows. And then it says, oh, I'm thirsty. So really not that much different from us. If you just hold a glass of water in your mouth for 12 hours, you're not going to be too happy. Neither is the plant. And so that's one of the challenges um, with the flood irrigation, which is very common here in Colorado, is if I'm flooding this field this direction, these plants are going to have a saturated, not have a chance to breathe as I'm waiting for that water to get all the way down to the other end. Um, the pivot systems, you all have seen those when you're flying over the circles. Everybody's probably familiar with that. Um, in theory, a decent way to, to water the plants, but we've also seen some challenges as the plants mature and go from uh, what we call veg mode, which is where they're putting on the leaves, and the flower mode, where they're putting on the colas or buds, is you can actually wash some of those trichomes. The trichomes are the little tiny dots of oil on that CBD plant, and that's what we're after. That's where the money is. That's where the medicine is. You can actually wash some of that off as you continue to water those plants, and there's some other challenges with that. Um, Drip irrigation is the last one space of running a drip line down. Uh, in our experience, we found that to be the most effective and also conserves the most water. Water is a precious resource that we have here in Colorado. And um, we all are trying to, as an industry, follow good, healthy farming practices. And I believe Rich is going to talk more in depth about that, so I won't uh, steal any of his thunder. Um, next step is preparing the land. Uh, again, this is examples of large-scale operations. A uh, typical CBD farm here in Colorado, uh, what's a guess on how big a typical CBD farm is here in Colorado? Ten acres or so? A little smaller than that, it's about five. About five acres is your average. Again, Dwayne, I'm sure has some specific stats on that, but that's a ballpark. About five acres is what uh, that would be. Five acres would hold approximately about uh, 8,000 plants, depending upon density, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so. Uh, one of the things uh, we talked about just a little bit in the, with the Rocky Mountain Flats discussion, um, testing for contaminants. Um, uh, cannabis plants in general are a remediation plant. So whatever is down in that soil is going to get up into that plant, and then potentially if we're consuming that plant in some form or fashion, it's going to get into us. And so it's really important. And um, f most people, really all of the farmers, should be doing tests for heavy metals and types of contaminants uh, through that process. Be a little careful where you're sourcing material from because it's not, it is kind of required, but not absolutely required. You can get product out here that has been around that. So testing the soil is first, and then looking at your land. Are you trying to grow on five acres, 40 acres, 140 acres? Do you have the equipment to do that? What's involved? I mean, it's a full-on farming there. Um, obviously, there are a lot of similarities in growing corn or soybeans or wheat, etc. cetera. Um, this just happens to be a little bit more profitable, potentially, depending upon how successful you are in growing. Um, on the right-hand side, this is what we refer to as plastic mulch. It's real common out in California, if you've ever gone by like the strawberry fields or something out where they're growing vegetables and the like. Um, for our organization, this is our preferred method for uh, planting and growing the crops, and we'll see some of this. So this is a three-row, obviously, mulch planter. And this is designed for planting clones, and we'll talk about that on our very next slide. Um, so your next decision, kind of in parallel with the land, is uh, do you want to grow from seeds or from clones? Um, there's a cost. There's a lot of differentiation on that. Um, growing from seed, uh, the benefits are you can put uh, that into a standard planter. Um, you can run down the field, and in a few days, you can plant 40, 60, 80 acres very quickly. The challenges with that right now uh, for our genetics are that there are very few um, seeds available that don't have a lot of males. Uh, we are a female-friendly crop, <laughs> meaning that we like the girls. Um, and it only takes a few boys to spoil the field. Um, and so right now, there is, uh, have been a lot of developments in seed going on. Um, but it has a long ways to go to get it to a point to where they're all feminized seeds and that that works. And so this is an example of a larger clone. So basically the advantage of this is you're planting it with a root structure, goes into a slightly different style of planter, goes into the ground, into that plastic mulch, and how we plant could be in a flood irrigation uh, watering uh, system as well. Uh, but that's kind of the difference. Genetics is a big player in this as well. 
Um, what type of genetics are you trying to grow? Again, goes back to your goals. Also goes into your environment. Are you growing in Palisade, Monta Vista? Uh, are you growing in Parker, Colorado, in the high plains, in the low, in the eastern plains, etc.? So you need to really understand that. Like a lot of plants, they're designed and do better depending upon the environment that they're in, the amount of sun, etc. Um, Next picture, this is uh, kind of what a finished field would look like. So this is about an 80 acre field um, done with uh, the plastic mulch. Um, you see the, one of the advantages of this is it helps with weed management as well. Uh, weeds will uh, fight those plants for nutrition as well as makes it much harder to harvest the plants. This helps to keep the plants clean, um, easy to water. There's a drip line which you can't see it r runs right down between. You'll notice the plants are staggered left, right, left, right. What that is is for um, not to puncture that drip line. The drip line runs down through the middle. Plant one plant on the left of the drip line, one plant on the right, and away you go. Um, harvesting is the next thing. Harvesting is a real challenge for our industry right now. There's really two ways to harvest. One is um, the manual way with loppers. Literally, you have a number of laborers, and you're out there, and you cut the plant down with the lopper and pick that plant up and head it uh, into somewhere to dry that plant. The industry this year did a lot of research on trying to figure out is there a mechanized way that we can harvest these plants. In this particular case, what they've done is they've cut all the plants down and they've sun dried them. Um, sun drying has a little bit of a challenge because it uh, degrades the quality and the amount of the CBD, not necessarily the quality, but definitely the amount of the CBD uh, that's available. And it, as this plant goes through, um, the CBD itself is an oil. And so every time something, either a person's hand or a metal piece of a harvesting piece of equipment touches that, that oil rubs off. And so what might start with 10% CBD, now, go, now sits out in the field and now it's at eight. It goes through this harvester, now it's at six and gets mulched up into a, uh, a, a silage. You will have a picture of that and none of the extraction techniques are 100% efficient. Maybe they're only 80% efficient. So your 10% plant that you're so proud of out in the field might end up being 4% biomass by the time you actually are trying to harvest that. And so there's some challenges with that as well. Um, drying and processing. This would be an example of what would come through one of the automated combines right now. It makes that silage. And this is just another, if we cut them down by hand, you end up um, needing to store them. If uh, a farmer were to grow, let's say, 500 acres as this industry scales, you'd need a few Walmart stores to dry your plant material. And so very unfriendly for a lot of reasons on that front. Um, next thing is uh, selling your crop um, and testing. And the, the percent of CBD is one of the key things when you're selling your crop. Um, we've been fortunate enough to come up with some uh, very great ratios. We've got some strains right now that have a 40 to 1. I mean, it's, it's 40 times as much CBD as it is THC. Um, and that's one of our uh, uh, phenotypes we're very excited about. All these things drive the value of your crop. The crop can be sold as bud or flower to someone else that's going to use the product in that fashion. You can take that down, uh, refine it into oil or isolate and turn that into a uh, product that you would sell to the wholesale marketplace. Or if you're so uh, inclined, you can actually go through, uh, and I just grabbed this off the web. I have no affiliation whatsoever with whatever these product lines are, the purely generic examples. Um, but run those down through to a finished product, oils and tinctures and salves, and uh, they do suppositories and inhalable products, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously everybody in this room is familiar with a lot of those um, types of applications. Uh, in finishing up, just a couple quick stats and facts. Um, typical spacing, depending upon the size of plants you're doing, is five feet by five feet, so you can get about 1,760 plants in an acre. Um, on a small scale, if you were to make your own clones, it costs you about $3 to make a clone, assuming you have access to greenhouse space and people that know how to propagate, etc. cetera. Um, if you just buy your clones, they're four to seven dollars a piece, so if you're gonna plant 100,000 clones, just in clones alone, you've got half a million dollars just in plant cost. Um, however, it's still very profitable at the end of the day. Average time from your six inch clone to finished product, again, genetics vary, 90 to 120 days is quite typical. Uh, finished plant 
On the low side, you produce a half a pound of dry, what we call biomass, which is once you've taken the leaves and the buds and turned it into that kind of silage mulch, up to a pound and a half, depending upon how lucky you get, how nice Mother Nature is to you, and how smart you've been in your genetics. Um, it takes about 40 to 60 pounds of biomass to make a kilo of isolate. Um, any clue what, uh, so uh, anybody know what a kilo of isolate's worth? About eight thousand dollars. About eight thousand right now, and so you can back your numbers into this. If I've got an eight thousand dollar at this end, and I need, assuming my plants are a pound a piece, <coughs> if I grow fifty plants, I can make a kilo of ice that's worth about eight thousand dollars. So the upside is very uh, is fantastic. That's why a lot of your farmers right now out there are coming in droves to try and get involved in our industry, because an acre of wheat might be worth. Uh, four or five hundred dollars, an acre of hay might be worth eight hundred dollars, an acre of CBD might be worth twenty-five to thirty-five thousand um, dollars. And so lots of upside on that. What's the uh, CBD concentration in the isolate? Uh, in the isolate? Ninety-five uh, percent. By NMR, the higher end isolates, ninety-five, ninety-six percent. If you do HPLC or other t uh, testing, on it, it always tests out at 99. I've had isolate test out to 104 percent because <laughs> our isolate was, any guesses, more pure than the standard. So our standard, our isolate actually exceeded the standard. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'll gladly take a couple questions. <laughs>